from 8 News Now, this is Politics Now with Steve Sebelius and Patrick Walker. Nevada state and congressional leaders are once again outraged at the Department of Energy and demanding answers. Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Sebelius. And I'm Patrick Walker. The latest transgression was the news that 32 shipments of radioactive waste sent to the National Security Site, or N2S2, between 2013 and 2018 were more dangerous than they were labeled. Governor Steve Sisolak said the shipments were labeled as low-level nuclear waste, but actually contained a more dangerous reactive nuclear material which means it may be explosive when mixed with other things. That led to Congressman Stephen Horsford calling for a resignation. Congresswoman Dina Titus cut to the chase a little bit more, saying, quote, the level of incompetence at the Department of Energy is only matched by its dishonesty, end quote. And Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman says at the very least there should have been some notification about the shipments. Our plea has been forever repurpose, deactivate, but let everybody know this is a possibility in the middle of the night or in the middle of a work day, this filth is coming through your community or maybe. The Energy Department confirmed that the shipments were uh, that sent were not in compliance with its protocols, but said they didn't pose any health or safety risk. The DOE says it has stopped shipments and is opening and investigation. So, Steve, this is even a different controversy than the one that we had talked about last year that led to Senator Cortez Masto holding up some of Trump's nominations. Yeah, that concern was over the Energy Department shipping a half metric ton of weapons grade plutonium for temporary storage at the National Security Site. The state was not informed of that shipment until after it had taken place. Now, the state's fighting that in court, and Cortez Masto held up all the Energy Department's uh, nominees until Secretary Rick Perry agreed not only to not ship any more plutonium here, but also a timetable to remove the plutonium that had already been shipped to Nevada. So the trust level, as you heard from Mayor Goodman, is very low here. Yeah, it doesn't seem to, like it's going to get any better anytime soon. Yep. Well, Nevada's first in the West Democratic Caucus is still seven and a half months away. It's set to take place on Saturday, February 22nd. Our caucus is making news with the announcement of its virtual component. I spoke with the party's chairman to find out how it works. With the spotlight intensifying on Nevada as one of the first states in the presidential nomination cycle, the state Democratic Party is refining how its first in the West caucus works. That includes a virtual component introduced to the public on Monday. It expands the accessibility and also allows us to be more accessible to communities that may not be able to participate uh, had they not have that virtual option. Assemblyman William McCurdy is the chairman of the Nevada Democratic Party. He says the goal is to get more people involved in the presidential nomination process. For those who can't show up to caucus on the actual day of, February 22nd of next year, Democrats have introduced a telecaucus, allowing registered Nevada Democrats around the world to participate and have their votes count just as if they were at a caucus site. So if you are, you know, overseas and, you know, you're not able to be here in person, you can now participate from where you are. If you are uh, disabled and at home and not able to, you know, leave your home, this allows you to participate in the process. As long as you have access to a phone, you can participate once you pre-register. The party will give you a secure access code. Then on February 16th and 17th, participants can dial in and make their choice as to who they want to be the party's presidential nominee. It'll be available in English, Spanish, and Tagalog. We're excited for what we're able to do. We're excited to um, provide more accessibility and more transparency and, and also you know, make sure that security is, is always at the forefront of everything that we do here at the party. So, Patrick, the, uh, the party's also doing other things to make it easier for Democrats to participate in the caucus. Aren't right. They? It almost has the feeling of a primary. In some cases, the party's hosting four days of early caucusing that will be held at a number of sites across the valley. And for those who want to participate in that actual caucus on February 22nd, the party will be allowing people to show up if they're not registered already to register as Democrats and be able to participate. So it's a day of uh, sign up as well. Hmm. Well, a new date has been set for an evidentiary hearing in the lawsuit about CCSD firing 170 deans. And in the meantime, Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara says he will take a step back and rethink that decision. As far as the court case, that hearing will take place on August 14th. The preliminary injunction blocking the move is in place until then. That lawsuit alleges that Jara violated the open meeting law by talking about the move behind closed doors, but not in public. At a CCSD board meeting this week, many of the board of trustees said they did not support the decision. The deans, among others, 
help to provide that important connection to the student's future success. Again, I do not support the elimination of high school or middle school deans or any equivalent position within the CCSD. Now, after the meeting, Jara said he'll see if there are other solutions to come up with $17 million rather than eliminating the dean's jobs. The school district has offered teaching jobs to those deans, but since the first day of school is August 12th, many are unsure whether they should take those teaching jobs or wait to see if they get their old jobs back. Michelle Fiore is the new mayor pro tem for the city of Las Vegas. That's the council member who fills the mayor's shoes when she is not available. The I-Team's Vanessa Murphy talked with Fiore this week to speak with her about her priorities and address some previous controversies. Well, Patrick, you know Michelle Fiore speaks her mind. Now in her role as mayor pro tem, she'll have an even larger platform as she'll at times represent the city of Las Vegas when she fills in for the mayor. You have a reputation as not holding back, speaking your mind. Will that continue as Mayor Pro Tem? Oh, absolutely. How so? Um, if you ask me something, Vanessa, I'm going to tell you the truth. Mayor Pro Tem Michelle Fiore has made headlines for controversial statements she's made, even going back to her days in the state assembly. I can tell you the great respect I have for my peer, Mr. Munn, for being the first colored man to graduate his college. We're in 2015 and we have a, a black president, in case anyone didn't notice. So the color and the race issue, um, I think it's time that we put that to rest and we go forth. The following year, after speaking up for cattle rancher Cliven Bundy and his supporters, she said this. We don't have a First or Second Amendment right, do we, to point a weapon at a duly authorized law enforcement okay, officer? Okay, so understand. Job, right? No, no, understand. We would never, ever, I would never, ever point my firearm at anyone, including a, an, an officer of the law, unless they pointed their firearm at me. And just last year, in a newsletter to constituents, she stressed how parents cannot be forced to vaccinate their children and said parents can fill out a form if they're against vaccinations. According to the Health District website, her guidance on exemptions was inaccurate. So I do not um, advocate not to vaccinate your children. What I advocate for you to do is get educated on which vaccines you're vaccinating them with, how old are they, just get educated on vaccines. Moving forward, Mayor Pro Tem Fiore says rather than just her ward as a councilwoman, she will be advocating for the city as a whole. The Las Vegas City Council has three new members. I have to tell you, our new council members seem absolutely fantastic. She worked with two of them in state assembly. She tells us they are bipartisan and the council will continue moving forward with development downtown, addressing homelessness and looking into pot lounges despite the state's current ban. She calls Mayor Carolyn Goodman her mentor for the past two years and after six minutes, the interview was done. Anything we didn't cover that you want to talk about? Absolutely not, Vanessa. You've been just peachy. Well, Vanessa, we, we've seen some of the headlines, of course, uh, some of the things that uh, Councilwoman Fiore has said that have, have made it into the news cycle. Uh, did you get a chance to ask her about also uh, her statements in 2015 about being able to treat cancer as a fungus with baking soda? We did ask her about that. As you know, the American Cancer Society disagrees with that. Um, we asked her about that. She believes the media put a spin on it. Mm -hmm. She says she was pushing for a right to try bill, which actually is federal legislation. Now, she says her message is about the right to try alternative medicine. All right, Vanessa, appreciate it. Thank you. Steve? Thanks, Patrick. Well, a resignation under pressure. The reason Labor Secretary Alex Acosta is giving for stepping down after an 11-year-old plea deal he gave to a man charged with child sex trafficking resurfaced. That's
Welcome back to Politics Now. Well, Labor Secretary Alex Acosta is resigning following criticism over his handling of a controversial sex trafficking plea deal more than a decade ago. Several members of Nevada's delegation had joined calls for his resignation in the last few days. Natalie Brand has the story from the White House. With President Trump at his side, Labor Secretary Alex Acosta says he's stepping down. Cabinet positions are temporary trusts. It would be selfish for me to stay in this position and continue talking about a case that's 12 years old. The president repeatedly praised Acosta and the work he did at the Labor Department. I just want to let you know this was him, not me, because I'm with him. He was a, he's a tremendous talent. We're going to miss him. Acosta came under fire this week after wealthy financier Jeffrey Epstein was indicted on new sex trafficking charges in New York. The arrest focused new attention on a plea deal Acosta brokered for Epstein in 2008 when he was then a U.S. attorney in Miami. Epstein spent just 13 months in jail after allegations of molesting teenage girls. Acosta defended his handling of the case earlier this week, but many Democratic lawmakers were unconvinced and demanded his resignation. Secretary Acosta did the right thing. The president said Deputy Labor Secretary Pat Pizzella will become the acting Labor Secretary, adding to the list of acting heads of departments within the administration. I think you know Pat. He's a good man, highly recommended by Alex. Acosta says he'll stay on the job for another week. He said with the economy doing so well, the focus must be on the Labor Department and not him. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, the White House. Justice Department officials, uh, their Office of Professional Responsibility, rather say it will investigate Acosta's actions while he was U.S. Attorney in Miami. Some of Nevada's Democratic state and federal lawmakers say a court case being argued in Texas could lead to the loss of health care and higher insurance prices here in Nevada. Here in Las Vegas on Monday, Congresswoman Susie Lee shared her own family's health care story. A dad who couldn't find a job with benefits, a mom who suffered a heart attack just before insurance coverage would have kicked in. Lee said health care is personal and vowed that she was going to keep fighting to save the signature achievement of former President Barack Obama no matter what. Think about it. Repealing the Affordable Care Act will take away health care from 1.2 million Nevadans. And let me be clear, as a member of Congress, I am going to do whatever I can to make sure that does not happen. Two Nevada state lawmakers lauded the progress made in the 2019 session of the legislature that wrapped up in, July, in June. Rather, They identified bills to increase the transparency in the price of prescription drugs, prevent surprising big bills for out-of-network emergency room care, and a bill to protect Nevadans with pre-existing conditions from being denied insurance, even if the Affordable Care Act is struck down. So will the health care here in America revert to the way it was before the ACA kicked in? The system was not broken before. You had, the system was not broken before, but we did not have some people covered. Some didn't want to be covered. Yeah, a little disagreement there among the panel. The face-off panel taking on whether or not that's a possibility and what the high court might rule. Plus, Susie Lee has a challenger for her congressional seat. The role Dan Schwartz says Donald Trump may play in that race. That's
on 8 News Now. Well, we mentioned earlier in the show that lawsuit being heard in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals over the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Will that case make it to the Supreme Court? We asked our face-off panel, KXNT radio host Alan Stock and Battleborn Progress Executive Director Annette Magnus. Nevada has a lot to lose if this case moves forward and ultimately gets to the Supreme Court, depending on how that ruling goes. I think that, you know, I'm glad that Attorney General Ford signed on in opposition to this case. We definitely need to protect the Affordable Care Act. Millions of Americans and Nevadans are at risk of losing their health care if this goes through. But not just their health care, it's the Medicaid expansion that Governor Sandoval, a Republican, put through here. That could go away. Pre-existing conditions could go away. Now, there was a bill in the Nevada legislature that went through and passed and was signed into law protecting individuals from pre-existing conditions, but it still remains that the rest of the country will be impacted by that. You also have things like women's health, preventative health care, the donut hole. All of these things will be impacted if this case moves through and then is ultimately overturned. So, so, what, so you think they'll they'll uphold the judge and go to Supreme Court? I think the Fifth Circuit will probably uphold the judge, mm -hmm. just knowing what I know about the Fifth Circuit and it being a conservative court, and then it will go to the Supreme Court, and that will be a fight that we will ultimately have to take there. Alan, what do you think? Do you, do you think it's going to go to the uh, Supreme Court? Do you think the Fifth Circuit will uphold? When they uh, initially put this together as a law that we weren't going to tell, be told what was in it until it was passed, that's what Nancy Pelosi said, uh, we, we were being told it was definitely, had nothing, had nothing to do with taxes. It was upheld as a constitutional concept by the Supreme Court based upon the tax and the tax only. That has been thrown out. Therefore, you have nothing left in this except to say that the government can tell you to go buy a product. I'm going to tell you to buy a certain pair of jeans or a doll or whatever you want. You know, I'm going to tell you to buy something. You can't do that. And the court did say that in the in the ruling. The court did say that in the ruling. So uh, uh, one, the uh, so-called ACA Obamacare is unconstitutional. It should be thrown out. Yes, it will. I agree. It will go before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, this court will uphold the other judge's decision. It will go to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and which I, I knew eventually would happen. And, and right. What happens so there then? Uh, be, because this was upheld solely on the taxing power, and yep. that tax has been reduced to zero, so the tax penalty is gone. Will it be upheld by the Supreme Court, or could it be struck down? No, it'll be upheld by the Supreme Court. I, I, I'm saying the lower uh, uh, judge's ruling oh, so will you're be upheld. So you the Supreme Court will overturn Obamacare. Uh, uh, Obamacare. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Uphold the court's ruling, but it, yeah, it, I want to be clear. Yes, yes. no, okay. I believe that they will All right. do that. I hope that we continue to have the Affordable Care act in this country. I hope we move forward and continue to have coverage for all of these different people in this country. The panel also weighed in on the Clark County School District's budget shortfall and firing all the deans and whether or not the president should be allowed to block followers on Twitter. It's all on our website, lasvegasnow.com. Patrick. All right, Steve, this is the race now where we keep you updated on all things election related. Billionaire Tom Steyer, who is the latest Democrat to jump into the presidential race this week. Well, he's already started buying TV ads in Nevada. In fact, his $1.4 million ad buy on TV, the single largest one so far in the primary. In addition to Nevada, spots will run in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. After Boulder City Councilman Kiernan McManus was elected mayor, the council had to appoint someone to fill his seat. But two of them, two of his uh, colleagues, wanted one candidate, two wanted a separate candidate. So it came down to what else? drawing lots. Tracy Folda won and will take the seat. She was McManus's pick, but he didn't say why. And in non-presidential election news, Congresswoman Susie Lee has her first challenger. Former Nevada State Treasurer and Republican gubernatorial candidate Dan Schwartz says he plans to run for the District 3 seat. He told the Associated Press he is running as a, quote, free market private enterprise candidate. Lee, a Democrat, won her seat in 2018 by soundly defeating Danny Tarkanian. So, Steve, did, did uh, the former treasurer give any indication that he's going to be embracing Trump pretty strongly in the race? Well, he said he thinks anti-Trump sentiment actually hurt Danny Tarkanian in the 2018 election. Remember, Tarkanian was Trump's number one supporter in all of Nevada. Schwartz uh, says he supports Trump, but he doesn't know if having his name on the ballot is going to hurt or help him in 2020. Well, former Nye County Sheriff Tony DeMeo passed away. I'll take a look back at his 12 years at the top of that department coming up on Politics Now.
3333. A former captain for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has passed away. Larry Burns died suddenly after a medical episode at the age of 61. He was a 27-year veteran with Metro Police. Burns also ran for sheriff against Joe Lombardo back in 2014, a race Lombardo won by a margin of 51 to 49. That turned out to be the closest election for sheriff since Metro was created back in 1972. Burns leaves a wife and six children. And a former sheriff of Nye County also passed away this week. Family members say Tony DeMeo died at Centennial Hills Hospital after suffering an apparent head injury days earlier at his home in Pahrump. Here's a look back at his career. He was making these wild accusations were which not founded and people now only hear one side. Outgoing and often described as outspoken, Anthony DeMeo, better known as Tony, served three terms as the sheriff of Nye County. He served during a tumultuous time in Pahrump politics. DeMeo was often at odds with then Nye County District Attorney Bob Beckett, including after the DA's arrest on fraud charges. And that DA's office doesn't give as much attention to those crimes as he does to the crimes against himself and the tying up of, of the office. The former sheriff was in the national spotlight in 2007, while his department investigated a videotaped sexual assault of a three-year-old girl. The sheriff's office released the girl's name and picture to try to generate new leads in that case. The suspect, Chester Stiles, was arrested a short time later in the Las Vegas area and is serving a 140 years to life prison sentence. Though extremely controversial, DeMeo defended his decision. For everybody to say, well, how come you didn't do this and do this? This is why everybody's critical of the investigation, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback. We believe that we did the right thing because of how quickly this was resolved. DeMeo retired from his post as Nye County's top cop in December 2014. He ran again against current Sheriff Sharon Worley last year, but was unsuccessful. The former sheriff was born in Brooklyn, New York, and served 25 years in the Jersey City, New Jersey Police Department before moving to Pahrump in 1998 with his wife, Linda. DeMeo was 67 years old. And DeMeo's wife told the Associated Press a memorial service will be planned in the coming days. She also said the family is not planning on having an autopsy performed. Well, this is What to Watch, where we tell you what we're keeping an eye on next week. The man who's the front runner for the Democratic presidential nomination is back in town next week. Joe Biden says he'll hold campaign events on Saturday in Las Vegas, but his campaign hasn't released details. And this isn't necessarily in the world of politics, though she will be covering a lot of it. But Nora O'Donnell takes over the CBS Evening News desk on Monday. She'll be the lead anchor for political coverage on primaries and election night as well. That's our show. Thanks for watching Politics Now. We'll see you next weekend. As always, catch us right here on LasVegasNow.com. Have a good weekend.